realized that the first word that I ever wrote was the word go. Two letters, not that much meaning, at least I thought. You see, I am very ambitious. I really go after what I want, and I don't see challenges as obstacles and things that stand in my way as something that will stop me. So when I first wrote that first word, I like to think that that kind of launched my career in writing. Because I don't see having to get a, a degree or go to college to really launch a career and start a passion of mine. In third grade, we had an assignment. Our teacher handed us out three pieces of paper, eight and a half by 11 inch white paper, and we had to fold them in half, hamburger style, and staple them on the side three times. That way it made a little six page book. And she said that we had one week to write a story. Um, you could write it on anything that you wanted. You just had to turn it in. It could be about whatever. And I decided to write a story about a girl named Abby. I really liked the name Abby. I don't know why I named her that. But she was a character who was like me. She was a third grader. She had brown hair. She had hazel eyes. And I realized that I was putting all of the qualities and the characteristics in Abby that I wanted to see in myself. Abby was a detective. She was solving mysteries in her community. She even went after bank robbers. She interviewed someone who stole money from her friend. But she was always curious and she was always asking questions. And I think it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually realized that Abby really was myself. I wanted to go out into the world and really ask questions and be a detective, but being a detective is very similar to being a journalist. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little today about how I really got into journalism and why I think it's really important to have youth voices in journalism, especially today. So when I first uh, started high school, I joined the paper. I really liked writing for the opinion section. That was my favorite section to write for. There were five sections. There was news, entertainment, features, sports, and opinion. But the reason I liked opinion so much was because I got to write about things that I didn't really, I hadn't really explored before. And so I got to see all these different perspectives and see all these different diverse opinions of actually people at my school and in the community. So that's why the following year I applied to be the opinion editor. So in my junior year, I was the opinion section editor. And this year as a senior, I am a managing editor in charge of recruitment and making sure that we actually have a, a diverse staff so that we get different opinions and perspectives reflected in the jacket. So the jacket is a self-sufficient, independent, student-run newspaper. That means that the money doesn't give us, or the school does not give us money, but how we do it is we have to fundraise for ourselves. And so that's a really tricky job. So on top of being um, a newspaper that distributes across the country to over 200 subscribers, we actually have to make all this money for printing um, as well and really get the word out about the jacket. So this is really a big part, I think, of where my writing has grown, where I really feel this passion for journalism, is because I've been in a school environment that really fuels um, and has very driven students in terms of writing and making sure that voices are heard. Now the next thing that I want to talk about is a little bit more, um, it's outside of school, but it's something that I've been very, very involved in. So my first and only job has been at Youth Radio in downtown Oakland. And so Youth Radio gives opportunities to youth in the Bay Area to actually work with different media outlets and help create stories and help create media content. And so I was a newsroom intern for the first time last summer. Not this past summer, but the summer before. And I actually produced a full-length feature story for NPR's All Things Considered. It aired this past spring, and so it took me about three months to work on it in the summer. Um, but because of radio scheduling, it's a really you know, crazy, unpredictable world in radio. And so they push stories back a lot. But my story aired this spring. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about this first story that I worked on, because it was an incredible experience. Um, and then I'm actually going to play a clip for you. So this first story that I worked on was pitched to me by my producer. You guys have probably heard about Willard Middle School. You probably know some people who go there. Um, but Willard Middle School was actually really in danger of losing their gardening program. And if you've ever seen the Willard Middle School campus, 
you'll see that half of the block that the school is on is actually taken up by their garden. And it's a beautiful garden, it's very expansive, um, and the school only takes about you know, half of that space. But the reason is because the school was losing money, they were worried that they wouldn't be able to keep funding the program um, and the classes that the kids were able to take. And so a few miles away, a new business had started. It was called Josephine. Josephine was a startup that employed home cooks in the Bay Area. And it was supposed to be a healthy alternative to picking up fast food. So instead of going to McDonald's or to Taco Bell, um, you could actually go on josephine.com and order a meal and it would say, okay, you know, you're going to get this chicken noodle soup. Um, you're going to go pick it up at this address, and it's going to be hot and fresh and homemade and nutritious because it's, you know, from all of these ingredients that are, are organic. Um, and it's going to be cheap, and it's going to be affordable. So Josephine heard of Willard Middle School's uh, dire situation regarding their, um, their gardening program. And so what they said is, hey, Willard, why don't we create a partnership? If we give you tools and resources, you can start a business model very similar to ours. And so what they decided to do was Willard Middle School continued their gardening classes, but they actually turned it into more of a cooking and economics class. So once a month, these kids, these seventh and eighth graders, just like you guys, were making meals for hundreds of people in their community and actually selling them. That first year that they did this, they made $30,000 in revenue. And Josephine got part of that money as well, but all in all, it was a very successful partnership. So I'm gonna play you um, a quick clip of the final product. And like Uber, Josephine.com is bringing some surprising players into the market. This week is meal week. We're gonna cook for close to 200. A few miles away at Willard Middle School in Berkeley, you'll see teachers prepping giant piles of vegetables from the school garden to be chopped by 12 and 13 year olds. The school is in its second year of partnering with Josephine.com to make and sell hundreds of meals every month with some adult supervision. Maybe you should cut this in half again because these are really gigantic. The partnership's a win-win. Josephine gets the kind of community credibility consumers want. The school gets a cool learning opportunity and a much needed source of ongoing funding. There are plenty of hurdles. 13-year-old Willard student Faye Rauber remembers their first massive meal attempt for Josephine.com. We had rice that we were making and it all didn't work. And so we had to go buy rice like a half an hour before people started coming. Despite mishaps like the rice incident, Last school year, Josephine's partnership brought the school more than $30,000 in revenue and accounted for 25% of Josephine's new customers. So as you guys can see, this program was so revolutionary that NPR wanted to put it on their Fast Food 2.0 series um, because it was really teaching uh, middle school students about basic economics and how to make really healthy decisions in their lives because they're really keeping this garden program, growing their own food and seeing what's put into it and what makes um, a healthy food option. So this past summer, I worked on my second story. So this was my second summer at Youth Radio. And I think it was my first day of summer that I walked in and I was turning in my work permit. It was supposed to be my first day of work. Um, you know, I was really excited about starting um, you know, a new session at Youth Radio and kind of seeing what story I would work on. And my producer came up to me and she had a very somber look on her face and she, you know, sat me down and she said, okay, Natalie, like, I have a story for you. Um, I know that, you know, we don't work on feature length stories until later in the summer um, when we've written a couple of commentaries and shorter pieces. But she really wanted to pitch this story to me early on and she said, I understand if you don't want to, it's a very hard story, um, but I think that you are the right one for the job. And so I don't know if you guys have heard about the um, sex scandal that came out earlier this year, um, earlier this spring, it broke nationwide, but basically um, 28 different police officers, from the, the majority of them from the Oakland Police Department, were found to have sexual relations with a 16-year-old girl. And this was something that broke nationwide and it was on CNN. Um, and people across the nation were shocked and disgusted, and rightfully so. But KQED had pitched a story to Youth Radio and said, 
We want to figure out if people should be shocked, if this should be a surprise, and what kind of conversation should this be starting. <coughs> so I agreed to do it because I wanted, like I said, I'm ambitious. I wanted to get to the bottom of this and figure out where is the core of this story and what, does, what dialogue needs to happen because of this? Because we can't keep saying this is awful, this is disgusting, this is horrible. It is, but we have to move forward. And so how are we going to take that step? And so I felt like it was my duty to talk to people who actually knew what was going on. So that's why I started reaching out to local youth advocates. I talked to a woman who was the director of a teen homeless shelter. And what we heard was actually very surprising. She said that she was not shocked, that she met with teens who were on the streets and who encountered this kind of interactions with police every day. And she told us that the, po the police system um, was broken when it came to um, sexual exploitation of minors. And so I'm going to play a short clip for you and then tell you a quick story about what I encountered. We're around a lot of Latino businesses. We have a lot of taquerias, panaderias. And so this is like the middle of international. That's 20-year-old Ariana Castellanos, a counselor with Bay Area Women Against Rape. This part of International Boulevard is known as the track, and it's where most of her clients get arrested by the Oakland police. The track is slang for um, kind of the area where you can find a lot of young girls who are being exploited or who are selling sex. The public may have been shocked by the news that Oakland and Richmond police officers were allegedly involved in the sexual exploitation of a minor. But when Youth Radio interviewed a cross-section of youth service providers, we found a common theme. Nobody is surprised. Just ask Amba Johnson, who runs the youth homeless shelter Dreamcatcher. Because everybody has long known the fact that the whole country is like, oh my God, what's happening with the Oakland Police Department is the most disingenuous response I've ever heard of in my life. So, Amma Johnson was the director who I spoke with. And when we first, when my producer and I first went to Dreamcatcher, we noticed something very shocking. This, this homeless shelter is not, does not have a sign. It does not have something um, that you know, claims that it's a homeless shelter. It was a just worn down house under the freeway in downtown Oakland. And when I stepped into that house, I was looking around at, you know, the teens sitting on the couch and kind of talking, and I recognized a boy who I had seen in the hallways at school every single day. And the reason that this hit me was because I realized that you do not know what is going on in people's lives when you encounter them. Now this is not someone I had spoken to, but to see him in this situation and for me to not realize that he was homeless really hit home and made me want to pursue this story even further. It was hard, like my producer said it was going to be when you know, she first pitched it to me, um, but it actually made me want to work even harder. And so that's why I'm here to talk to you guys and give you a few more tips on how I think that you can apply aspects of journalism into your daily lives. And so why is youth journalism important? Because it makes youth feel that their voices matter, because they do. And so when we have youth voices in journalism and telling stories, it actually helps you find your own voice. And I'm going to expand on that a little bit more. But the first thing that I would say is ask a question. Like Abby, when I was writing in third grade, she never stopped asking questions. Asking a question, getting an answer, and that leading to another question. The next thing I would say to do is read. Read everything. Read the newspaper sitting next to you on BART, read the back of your cereal box, and you'll realize that words have the power to make you feel any emotion in the world. And then finally, I would say be limitlessly curious about the world. One of um, a, a very famous journalist, Henry R. Luce, he was the creator of Time Life magazine said, I became a journalist to come closer, as close as possible to the heart of the world. And so I leave you with that quote because that is really what has driven me from the word go until now, when I'll be heading off to college soon. And I think that we can all apply these aspects every day, not to become a journalist, but to come cl as close as possible to the heart of the world. Thank you.